In Postgres, when you start a transaction that touches some rows, whether update, delete, or insert, uh, Postgres uh, creates a new version of the row that touch it, that you touched and uh, creates those new values in the new version and keeps the old version for many reasons. Uh, one, one reason is for old transactions that are currently running to see this the old state of the row as it existed in their uh, in the beginning of their own transactions this to this is to ensure uh, uh, essentially consistency and isolation in the MVCC but now if the transaction that you start touches many 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 rows let's say you have 50 million rows this transaction is updating almost all of them obviously that doubles the amount of rows on your database right so you need more space but but take this scenario what if right before that transaction actually wants to commit something happens and it fails and it needs to roll back what happens to all these rows that are now invalid? Because technically the transaction, to ensure atomicity, this transaction is invalid. It should, should better delete all these versions. But if you think about it, I'm about to roll back, whether an explicit rollback from the actual user or a rollback as a result of a failure catastrophic failure database crash anything right a constraint error it's infeasible for Postgres to actually sit down and turn around and delete those rows almost impossible because it's gonna take as much time as it took to actually insert them right to begin with so Postgres have this process called vacuum to take care of uh, these situations when you have dead tuples, as they call it. So a vacuum is a post process that you can run explicitly if you want, or then uh, a daemon can run, an auto uh, process can run and cleans those up. Obviously, uh, vacuum takes finite amount of time, finite amount of space, and memory, and that's why most vacuum processes are also throttled by Postgres. You can control that as well, because it does consume CPU at the end of the day. But yeah, when you run vacuum, you'll see that these rows are just going to be cleaned up and uh, removed from your table. And when they are removed, not necessarily you're going to get more physical space on disk right but you're gonna get as a result uh the, the the pages that you queried that had those dead tuples right queries that 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 you make right against an unvacuumed postgres instances will pull those pages and we'll have those dead tuples in those pages right and as a result your database must now filter out those dead tuples first of all it needs to know that uh, those tuples are dead and and technically that check to check if a tuple is alive or not is kind of expensive because what you need what does what postgres needs to do is just takes a look at the transaction that created that row and see if the state of that transaction is this transaction committed and that's another table in postgres it's, hey are you committed or are you rolled back if you rolled back then I'm, I'm technically not supposed to read this this is a dead tuple so there is cost associated with everything in databases right the other cost is when you actually pull that page and 
find out that some rows are dead. Unfortunately, you took the hit to do that I.O., to pull that page in memory, and you're looking for some live rows, right? But what do you find instead is, uh, <laughs> is, is the, the, so most of the rows are dead. So you have to filter them out. So if the page has around 1,000 rows and 99 nine, uh, of them are dead, right, and one of them are alive, then your query, your I.O. to the disk, just pulled a single row. What an expensive page, right? What an expensive, expensive page request. So vacuum cleans those up. So future rows can be put on the same page, live rows, find I say, right? And uh, this will uh, gives you, uh, as, you say, as they say, more money for your buck. Is that the saying? Uh, no, it's not the saying. But it, that, that single I.O. is going to give you so much. Obviously, you might say, Hussein, this seems to be a Postgres problem. No. No, it's all simple basic stuff there's no magic in databases every database deals with stuff differently mysql uses uh, something called the an oracle for that matter and i believe sql server it's something the undo lock so what 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 mysql does it actually it doesn't keep versions right it it, it changes the actual final row and it keeps the old version in another structure it's called the undo as the changes keeps track of what changes so if all transaction becomes technically slower because they have to crack open those undo logs and kind of reapply those changes to read um, old rows right and it's the same problem what happens if you roll back? You have a bunch of undo logs that you have to crack open. The database is responsible for that. And it better apply it on the live final state of the row in the heap or the index. The problem exists, right? Regardless. And I've seen some databases, specifically SQL Server, that doesn't even allow you to do anything, right? So you, it limits you. Not either everything, but it limits you what you can do until it's actually fully rolled back. I had a transaction that failed after one hour in SQL Server, and the data. And I then just decided, you know what? I give up. Let me restart the database. And the database says rolling back. <laughs> it's stuck in a rolling back state for over maybe forty minutes, just trying to reapply the changes. The rolling back to get you to a state that you can actually make the database useful. Everything comes back to the fundamentals, really. It's, it's all simple things. And once you understand these simple things, uh, it will make you make better decisions on which database you can pick. That's it for me today, guys. This is something I wanted to talk about. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.